Hi everybody. Welcome to Author's Voice where we are connecting authors to the world. This is Solved and I am Libby Fisher Hellman, your host. And this is also high season for books coming out. The fourth quarter are when all of the heavy duty mysteries and crime thrillers come out. And we are very fortunate today to have one of my favorite authors and a returning author to Author's Voice, William Ken Kruger. Well, thanks, it's a pleasure to be here. Are you calling me one of the heavy hitters? Is that uh, what you're saying I, I there? Guess, yeah, oh, take thank it for, you, take thank it you. what it is. It's <laughs> the only compliment you'll get out of me today. Um, I did want to mention to anyone who's watching out there that if you'd like to order one of Kent's latest books, well, the latest book, Desolation Mountain, all you have to do is to go to authorsvoice.net and you'll see a little screen and below the screen you just follow the directions and click and um, we will send you a signed copy as soon as we can. So with that, let's talk a little bit. <clears throat> Pardon me about Desolation Mountain. All right. Where did the idea come from? Uh, well, shall I give a, just a brief synopsis of the story, and then I'll tell where it came sure. from? Sure. Would that be okay? That would be sure. Sure, I'll do whatever you want me to. <laughs> really? Did you hear it? So here's the Down and Dirty on Desolation Mountain, which is number 17 in my Cork O'Connor series. A private charter plane carrying a U.S. senator and her family crashes on Desolation Mountain, killing everyone on board. Desolation Mountain is in a remote section of the Iron Lake Ojibwe Reservation. Because it's on the res and because it's in a remote area of the res, the first responders to the tragedy are all Ojibwe men from the reservation and they happen to be friends of Cork O'Connor. Shortly after that tragedy, those first responders, those Ojibwe men, friends of Cork, begin to vanish. And as Cork and his son Stephen dig deeper and deeper into the mystery of those disappearances and the mystery that's at the heart of the crash itself, they begin to realize that there is an evil lurking in the great north woods far more powerful and more malevolent than they could ever have imagined. So the first 50 pages or so, uh, when I was reading it, you really got me because I wasn't sure whether we were talking about a Wendigo, a malevolent spirit, yeah. or just some really awful people that were yeah. doing awful things. So um, that was nice. Good. I was, done. That's exactly what I was going for. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so the idea for it. The seed of the idea came from a, a, a real event. Um, several years ago, for many years, um, the state of Minnesota, my home state, had uh, as our senator, one of our senators, uh, a fine man named Paul Wellstone. Shortly before the election that would have returned Wellstone to the Senate for yet another term, just a few weeks before that election, the plane that he was flying in crashed in northern Minnesota and everyone on board was killed, a number of his family along with him. Because of that tragedy and because of its proximity to the actual election, uh, it, uh, it resulted in that Senate seat going to his opponent. And that one seat shifted the entire power in Congress from one party to another. Because of that, the coincidence of the timing of the crash, and because the National uh, Transportation Safety Board investigation that, that resulted was not their finest hour, um, it, was, uh, it was in many ways a, a rather slipshod investigation. Um, a lot of conspiracy theories, of course, have, have arisen around it. Um, I didn't want to use the actual crash or the details of that crash to create the story, but what that did, Libby, was get me to thinking about, about the idea that our government is this many-headed monster, and every head has its own ego, its own agenda, its own territoriality, and I don't care who's in, in the White House or what party is in power, that monster continues to move forward on its own. And there are so many things that are going on at the higher levels that you and I have no idea about and over which we have no control. And that was one of the central ideals of, mm -hmm. uh, of uh, Desolation Mountain. Interesting. You know, some would say that the fact that the bureaucracy keeps going despite the people who are at the top is a good thing at least today. The yin and the yang of that, you know? Yeah. Court Sun mm -hmm. is much more prominent in this book than he has been in some of the others, well, except for Red, Red 
Red Knife? Red, Actually, Red Temerac Knife. County was a Stephen, was the last real Stephen book. Oh, okay. okay. Uh, but so, several books ago, you're right. So, and I know um, people are asking you if Stephen might be one day going to take <laughs> over for Cork, but I think it might be Annie. Do you know, what I've tried to do is create a situation in which uh, Cork is the lead character. Yeah. But his family play prominent roles. And more and more I've been trying to breed their lives in with Cork and with all of the, uh, the action and the mysteries that occur in the books. Or Annie's husband, Daniel? Is that uh, it's saying? Jenny. Jenny, That's sorry. okay, Jenny sorry. and Jenny's husband, Daniel. Right. They figure prominently, as does Rainey, Cork's new wife. Right. So, and little Wabu, the new addition. So they're all playing important roles. Yeah. Um, I, I never have it in my head to get rid of Cork as the primary, uh, as the primary guy. But, uh, but I like the fact that I can bring in other characters and involve them significantly. And so... Um, uh, work more on their development, right. present their development more fully to, to the audience. Speaking of other characters and not wanting to get rid of Cork, what about Henry? Yeah, what about Henry? Yeah, Henry when is Henry going to kick yeah, the bucket? Yeah, yeah, sorry. yeah. For anybody who doesn't really uh, follow my series, Henry Malou is, a, is one of the recurring characters, maybe one <laughs> of the, uh, besides Cork, probably the most important characters in the book. You know, he's a... Uh, he is a very old man, 105 years old. He's a meat day, a member of the Grand Medicine Society. He's a healer. And he's Cork's, he has been Cork's mentor through all of the books. Uh, but he is very old, and he's become frailer and frailer in the last few books. And for those readers who read Desolation Mountain, once they reach the end, the question of the longevity of Henry is really left, left hanging. Mm -hmm. So I don't know. We'll have, I have two more books in the Cork O'Connor series in mind. I'm just eager to get started on them. Um, Desolation Mountain completes my contract, so we'll negotiate a new contract with two more books in it. So Henry will be around for at least two more books. Oh, okay. All right. Well, I imagine you're going to have to have a whole book to describe his ascendancy into the spirit <laughs> his, land. His taking to the path of souls. I have, uh, I have promised readers and, and myself that when Henry finally uh, takes to the path of souls, it will be a great death. Ah, okay. And it may be the end of the series, I don't know. Well, it, you're in up to 17 now. Yeah, that's pretty. That's a long series. Yeah, it is a long series. Congratulations <laughs> well, thank to you. you. Thank and you, thank also you. the fact that Desolation Mountain uh, was number six on the New York Times bestseller yeah, list. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We're still shooting for number one. We don't know. Uh, well, you know... You can still say you're the New York Times best-selling author because every book since what ordinary no before ordinary Grace. the last nine books have all been New York Times wow. bestsellers. Wow, nice, well, nice thank job, you. thank nice you. Job. Um, so you've all, you've not just been writing the Cork series. You have after the incredible success of Ordinary Grace, you are writing a companion novel, and um, I know it's pretty much done. Let's. What, do you, what can you tell readers about it? Sure, can I talk a little bit about the, um, the journey of the writing of, of that course. particular manuscript? Because I think it's, well, I think it's an interesting journey. <laughs> <laughs> so Ordinary Grace, uh, when, my, when I proposed the project to my publisher, didn't want it. Uh, they really only wanted Cork O'Connor novels from me. So uh, I knew if I wrote that story, it was going to be a very risky proposition. My publisher didn't want it. I had no idea if anybody else was going to want it. But it was a story that spoke to me in such a deep, compelling way that I had to write it. Um, so I spent three years uh, on that manuscript. And even though my publisher didn't want it, I went ahead and sent it to my editor in New York City at Simon & Schuster. She fell in love with it. They published it. And the book is... Wait, had... wait. I remember you said something. She was on the train. Oh, yeah. She was on the subway crying. Yeah, when she, she was reading the yeah. story and she missed her stop or something. Yeah, yeah. She, uh, yep, that's basically the story. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, uh, so when it came out, it, uh, it has had you know, this wonderful reception. It, it's, it continues to sell extremely well. Uh, it's been picked up by many, many, many foreign publishers now. And my publisher, when they, when they saw how well that project had done, they wanted a, a companion novel, a follow-up novel. So I signed a contract and for the next uh, two years worked on what I believed would be the companion novel to Ordinary Grace. Now that was due three years ago. 
Yeah. Uh, <laughs> two months before the contractual obligation obligated deadline, I uh, I set I set up a meeting in Ch- here in Chicago with my uh, agent to talk about revisions to the piece because there were problems with it. She knew it. I knew it. Two days before I met with her, I sent her an email saying, "When we get together, I want to." I don't want to talk about how we revise this piece. I want to talk about how we keep it from being published because it wasn't the story I'd imagined it would be. I didn't know how to make it that story. And frankly, I wasn't interested anymore. Uh, so I, as it turns out, I have a very understanding publisher. So they said, fine, you don't have to give us this manuscript, but you still owe us a companion novel uh, to Ordinary Grace. So here's the deal, Libby. What... The expectations for that follow-up manuscript were enormous. They just crushed me while I was trying to write the story. But as soon as all those expectations, all the weight of that was off my shoulders, and I felt free again, I saw the story I should have been writing. And that's what I've been at work on the last uh, two and a half years. The novel will be called This Tender Land. This Tender Land. I call it a companion novel. Because it's not a sequel to Ordinary Grace uh, for readers who, who have read Ordinary Grace and love the drum family. It doesn't deal with the drum family. I told their story in Ordinary Grace. I call it a companion novel because like Ordinary Grace, it's set in southern Minnesota rather than the northern mm-hmm. Minnesota of my Cork O'Connor series. And like Ordinary Grace, it's set in an earlier time. Ordinary Grace was mm-hmm. set in the summer of 1961. This Tender Land is set in the summer of 1932, deep in the Depression. It's the story of four orphans running from the law because they have committed a heinous crime, but for the right reason. Uh, They know if they take to the roads, they're going to be captured very quickly because a huge manhunt has been launched to catch them. They're afraid to ride the rails, as everybody else is doing back in the Depression, because the railroads were patrolled by private policemen called bulls, and the bulls had this incredible reputation for cruelty, so they're afraid to ride the rails. So instead, they decide to take to the rivers. They canoe a river called the Gilead to the Minnesota. They canoe the Minnesota to the Mississippi, and their plan is to canoe all the way down the Mississippi to St. Louis, where they believe they have family and they'll be safe. I have always wanted to write an updated version of Huckleberry Finn. This is my Huckleberry Finn. I so love this story. It's scheduled for publication in uh, in September of 2019, and I can't wait for it to get out there. We can't either. You'll have to come back again. I will. You'll have it. (laughs) Sure. Okay, so there's 17 court books, excluding Iron Lake, which was the first, and this one, Desolation Mountain, which is your favorite. My absolute favorite is right in the middle of the series. It's a a novel called Thunder Bay. And I love Thunder Bay for three reasons. The first is that it's the story of Henry Malou and how he became this extraordinary individual uh, that Cork, whose wisdom Cork relies on so significantly. Um, The second reason I love it is is that it was my first attempt at a first-person narrative. So I... I, it was, I took kind of a risk with the structure of the novel. The first part of the novel is first-person Cork relating the story. Mm-hmm. The middle is third-person Henry Malou's story. And the last part of it, we return to Cork's voice telling the story again. So it's first, third, first. Didn't know if it would work, but I really liked yeah. I liked the challenge yeah. in doing something different. And the, the third reason it's my favorite is I love the theme that's at the heart of that story, which is all of the sacrifice that we're willing to make in the name of love. Great, great theme. Now, that said, my second favorite in this series right now is the book that came out last year, Sulphur Springs, because it's such, it deals with such... What about Rainy Sun? uh, Yes, the one that takes place in Arizona and really deals with the issue of the border and the the refugees Mm -hmm. are streaming Mm -hmm. across it. For me, it was such. It, it continues to be such an important issue for our nation that I really wanted to talk about it. So mm-hmm. I, I, I love Sulphur Springs for many reasons, not the least of which is that at the heart of it is really an important issue in our in yeah, our society I, today. I wrote about that before. Yeah, you did. Pop, before it was popular. Double. Double back. Double back. That's yeah. right. And, yeah. we, and we did did our research in the same areas. Right. Yeah. Right. And I had a drug tunnel going under the Mexican border to a factory uh, on the U.S. side. I remember so, that. Yeah. 
which is not out of the uh, no, realm of possibility at all. There. I remember, yeah. I remember seeing it in my mind, and it was I, I the mayor of of uh, Douglas, Douglas, Arizona. Thera, his brother, <laughs> apparently, according to rumor, had the drug tunnel running through his his property. So anyway, what is the hardest part of writing for you? Revision. Really? Why is that? Because I love everything else. Um, I love having the idea come to me and letting it kind of gestate in my head until I actually know how it begins and how it ends and who does what to whom and why and all of that. That whole period is just so much fun. Um, then I love the actual writing of the story, the writing process itself. I mean, that's really why I'm a writer. I love that part of what the process. What is it about it that you love? Um, I, I love working with the narrative elements. Plot for me is, uh, quite honestly, is the least engaging part of what I do. Plot's important, but, um, but nar the narrative elements are what really, is what really forms the art of what you and I do. I mean, plot is craft. It's all mm -hmm. craft. Mm -hmm. But the narrative elements are the art of the storytelling. It's how do you create believable, complex, rich characters? How do you create a profound sense of place? How do you weave your themes in seamlessly? Um, how do you make sure you've got language that's powerful? How do you make sure that your dialogue just sings? All of that stuff that makes a story great. That's what interests me. And so that's what all of the writing process is about. How to, to take that, the, the plot itself and create a really rich narrative around mm -hmm. it. And then you have to revise, and I hate revision. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny because I love revisions. I know you and I differ, and you know a lot of a yeah. lot of writers feel exactly like you. I mean, do. because it kind of yeah, I know when my editor comes back at me and says, you know, with a suggestion, and I know also that they're just trying to make it better, and I kind of know in my gut, yeah, they're right. I, I this revision needs to be made. You're, you total, you know. So I, I usually make the revisions, um, but I love editing. I love taking. Well, you're the, a good editor. I mean, well, thank you. I, I've seen what you've accomplished with other people's manuscripts. You're yeah. a fine editor. Thanks, but I like taking the half formed or the half baked pie, and and um, cooking it a little bit more, or putting out a little bit more filling in, and and you know making it better, because it's already there, and I don't have to start from scratch. It's it's. Still, that day when I'm starting a new book and I sit down in front of the computer screen and I'm like, oh, I'm not really, am I really doing this again <laughs> for, the, for the 18th time or, or whatever it is. See, the writing for me is the exciting part and the revision is the drudge. Hmm. I'm kind of the opposite. But anyway, what um, if you could start all over again, no Cork O'Connor, no series, no Ordinary Grace, what would you write? Uh, ghost stories. <laughs> <laughs> if I could write anything else other than what I do, I would love to create a great classic ghost story. Because, you know, one of the reasons I'm a storyteller is I was a Boy Scout. And, you know, anybody who goes camping, when you're around a campfire at night, what do you tell? You tell ghost stories. And so I grew up on, on these great ghost stories. So if I could, I would, I would love to create a body of, of uh, supernatural work. I really yeah. would. Did, well, you also, didn't you a few years ago put together a collection for a uh, young adult? For 12-year-old uh, for yeah. boys, essentially, was right. the audience. Because I, I, um, I have published short stories in Boys Life magazine, which mm -hmm. uh, is, the, uh, is the official magazine for the scouting program. Four million readers around the world. Oh, my God. So, yeah, I've uh, published. And the last story I did for them was a story called uh, The Wendigo. Mm -hmm. Which you know mm -hmm. builds on the classic uh, um, Ojibwe monster, uh, Native American monster of myth, and I, I just got such a great response to that. I got the first fan letter I ever received from anybody under fifty years of age. A twelve-year-old <laughs> boy in Texas sent me a, a note saying, "Dear Mr. Kruger, I love the Wendigo. It scared me so much. Would you please write more scary stories?" So I thought, "Well, sure. Let's give that a shot." So I wrote thirteen stories for uh, for meant for twelve-year-old boys. That was the audience. Um, reluctant readers was what I was hoping for, and uh, 
and had a lot of fun, but I have never really you know, tried you to get it published. You could self-publish it. Well, I could if I wanted to. We'll yeah. see. Yeah. I mean, those were good stories. I think I read most of them. Well, they, were, they were pretty good. We will see. Life is long. Who knows? Like, well, yeah, life is long. Maybe somebody out there in the audience. Uh, <laughs> Maybe a publisher <laughs> there, there you go. There you go. Yep. Yep, yep, yep. They work almost middle grade. I mean, yeah, that's what I was shooting for, yeah. middle grade. Yeah, yeah, so that's good. So you would write ghost stories. You wouldn't try to write the great American novel. Anymore. Oh, I tried that. I, I tried that for years and years and years, yeah. and I sucked at it. <laughs> <laughs> and that's when, you know, I went through my midlife crisis at 40 and, uh, and decided, you know, to hell with the great American novel. I want to write something somebody might actually want to read. So I looked around to see what people read. And you and I both know what people read is mysteries. Everybody reads mysteries. Um, because it's a, it's a genre that cuts across, whose appeal cuts across mm -hmm. all socioeconomic levels. So I decided I'm going to write a mystery. And uh, mm -hmm. yeah, turned to, mm -hmm. uh, to writing the Cork Okara series. Who's your favorite, aside from Cork, who is your fa and Henry, who is your favorite character that you just can't wait to write when you're writing a Cork book? Do you know, I am um, becoming more and more fond of Rainy Bissonette, Cork's, uh, second wife. Uh, I brought her into the series because you know, Cork. <laughs> so here's why I brought her into the series. Okay, so Cork's first good. wife dies, and uh, and Cork's alone for a couple of books, and I finally had a reader write to me and say, and he's he's lonely and he's trying to figure out who he is um, at that point in his life, and I had a reader write to me and she said, uh, dear Mr. Kruger, first of all I have to tell you I'm a grandmother, but I feel so sorry for Cork. He seems so alone. When is he going to get some? <laughs> so I, I figured it was, it was time to, to, to bring somebody into Quirk's life who might That's solve really that funny. issue for him. Oh. Uh, so I brought Rainy in and, um, <laughs> and, and really with Sulphur Springs, I began to explore the complexity of Quirk's mm -hmm. new wife. And I just began to love her uh, tremendously. And I like how she is influencing Cork's, the direction of Cork's life um, and Stevens to a certain extent. I just uh, like her, what she adds to the series. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I, I, Still, uh, one of the readers is mad that you killed off Joe. <laughs> well, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but I get that all the you time. You probably still get that. So, okay. All right, you said you had two really great ideas. Really quickly, what's one of them for uh, the next Cork book? Sure, sure, the next Cork book is actually going to be a prequel. Um, it's, I'm going to take Cork when he was 13 years old. It seems to me I'm writing all 13 year old boy protagonists these days. Interesting. But it'll be the summer, it'll take Cork through the summer uh, before his father dies. Um, his father was killed, I, I created that early in the series. His father, who mm -hmm. was sheriff of Tamarack County, was killed in the line of duty. Um, and in, in so many ways that uh, directed Cork's own uh, life path. So I'm going to take that summer before his father dies and take Cork through that summer, a profound mystery that occurred that summer that his father was involved in, and we'll take it all the way up to his father's death. So I can show readers um, Henry Malou when he was a much younger man, Sam Wintermoon when he was still alive, the relationship that Cork's father and Cork mo Cork's mother have. I can bring in Grandma Dilsey, who was important to Cork. All of these people that our backstory mm -hmm. in the series and present them as real mm -hmm. life, still okay. living Interesting. people. Interesting. Yeah, I'm, I'm excited about it. That'll be fun. And then the, the book after that will pick up where Desolation Mountain left off okay. and we'll follow what occurs the with, okay. with See what's particularly going. with uh, Henry Malou. Oh, okay. We will, get, we will keep, uh, keep waiting for those. In the meantime, we have um, this tender land to look forward to. So anyway, Thank you so much for spending some time with us. What you a is, pleasure it is to be here. You are also one of the most hardworking authors I know because the book came out in August and it's now October and you're still on the road every day. Yeah, for another month. Wow. Amazing. Anyway, thank you for spending some time with us. Thank you. And that sort of wraps up, well, it does wrap up Solved for today, but please come back on Thursday uh, when we will have Lisa Unger, whose new novel, Under My Skin, has just come out, or it'll be out the Tuesday before we have her, and I can't wait to talk to her. And if you're a Lisa Unger fan, as, as I am, you'll, be, you'll really want to tune in. 
So thanks again. Um, again, if you'd like a signed copy of Desolation Mountain, um, Kent's going to sign some copies before he leaves, and all you have to do is go to authorsvoice.net to get them. And we are very glad you joined us today, and we'll see you on Thursday. Thank you.